Clubhouse is the brand new voice-only social media network that's starting to hit the mainstream. It's been called a non-stop podcast that you can drop in and take part in. Clubhouse is now valued at over a billion dollars and companies like Facebook are racing to create competitors. In this film, we look at whether the hype is justified, what kind of dynamics show up on the app, and what does it mean in the epic battle between big tech and old media. It's basically challenging the media position as gatekeepers. The, the, the legacy media's whole raison d'etre is that they can decide what conversations are allowed, what are not allowed, how those conversations should happen. After Brett Weinstein's recent struggle session, is it a cancel culture wasteland? Uh, I'm happy to do all these things, but I would ask you to try to listen. No, fully. no listen, listen, no, white man, we're in charge you. here, okay? We ask you some questions, you can answer them or you can go. And there was a lot of articles about, oh wow, Clubhouse is, is a woke, cancel culture wasteland. It's actually the opposite, because a lot of supposedly cancelled people have actually made a comeback on Clubhouse. And does voice compared to text mean that new kinds of sense making are possible? There's something about meeting together and having a kind of conversation that takes us beyond our normal frame of reference that we desperately crave, you know, and Verveki calls us dialogos. You know, this is really uh, lies at the heart of Western philosophy, this kind of dialogue that changes us. Rebel Wisdom has just set up a club on Clubhouse. So maybe see you there. Well, hear you anyway. Hope you enjoy the film. So yeah, what is Clubhouse? First question. A lot of people have called it a kind of rolling podcast. And I mean, what I find really interesting is that this has taken off and it's sort of now now getting like a lot of mainstream pickup. It sort of feels like it's in its kind of explosive growth phase and it's it's certainly kind of entered the mainstream conversation. And the the interesting thing is that I think both Peter with the Stoa and Rebel Wisdom with our digital campfire have kind of been evolving towards something similar in terms of the value of synchronous com conversation rather than asynchronous. The sort of sense that uh, the quality of conversations on things like Facebook and Twitter is just not high enough. And there's something about being in a space together with other people that is uh, compelling, that feels like you're part of a, of, a, of a shared experience that is irreplaceable in some ways. So Elon Musk came on Clubhouse for the first time not long ago and said something, I think he said, context switching is the mind killer. So the sort of sense that with what social media has been doing to us, what this kind of hacking of our brains by these really powerful technologies like Tristan Harris talks about, is we're essentially, our, our consciousness is essentially fragmented, our attention is hacked, um, is mined, and we're, we're very fragmented beings. So if you're on Clubhouse and you've turned off your notifications, you're in a conversation and it's, it, it allows a form of kind of uninterrupted flow that I think we struggle in many other areas with, with kind of the inundation of notifications. There's another factor which Ali's gonna talk about a bit more later on, which is that voice gives us far more depth in a very subliminal way than text does. We've talked a lot on Rebel Wisdom about polyvagal theory, about the vagus nerve being the thing that regulates our, our nervous system into a kind of fight or flight or a receptive response. We're either in a curious frame of mind or in a defensive frame of mind. And the, the vagus nerve is intimately connected to our voice. Like we're, we're tracking, it basically tracks what's going on in all of our major organs, all of our major, including the belly, where we do a lot of our kind of sensing and sense making, and then the voice conveys it. So we understand and, and pick up a lot more on voice than we do on other mediums. So far, I think the, the real power of Clubhouse has been that it's been a relatively elite conversation. It started in the, it obviously sort of started in the tech industry and was really peopled by the friends of some of the founders. Uh, two founders who, who are very popular in Silicon Valley, they kind of had a, a very small platform for a while then it kind of started expanding. There's a whole story about how they built their social graph over time. Um, that's really, really fascinating. Don't have time to go into it now, but um, maybe at a future time we could talk about that because it's really interesting how they did that. And obviously they've still got this sort of sense of scarcity from the invites, but it is in a kind of really explosive growth phase at the moment. 
and there's a question of what are the dynamics going to be once we get past those kind of early adopters. There's also big privacy concerns about, about Clubhouse. They basically have access to all of your contacts when you join the platform. Interestingly, even now when I go onto Clubhouse, it recommends the two num people that it recommends me the most are a cab driver I used in Bali and the place I got a massage in Hackney. And apparently, I wouldn't know anything about this, of course, but apparently like people have seen their drug dealers' phone numbers coming up there and, and all of that stuff in, in San Francisco because so many other people have that number in their, in their um, contact list. And also, Clubhouse is recording conversations. They didn't originally, they do now. Mostly, um, they say that they record them and then delete them if there were no um, concerns about the conversation in the room, but they record them for moderation afterwards. Uh, there was also concern about some of the data going through China. Um, but the, the biggest thing, I think, is the amount of aggressive harvesting of people's social connections that they're getting when they go on the, on the app. And, and the other big question that I think will probably come through in the chat afterwards is, what are the dynamics of the, of the app? As we said in the title, clout chasing is a really big thing. The big players on Clubhouse are kind of making the market. We had the experience last week where we had a, we had a conversation one of, uh, that we put on and we had about maybe 100 people in the room and then Eric Weinstein dropped in. And immediately the room went to about 2,000 people because the way that it works is when your friends basically see when you're in a room. So Eric Weinstein has got two million followers on the app and as soon as he dropped into our room, it just basically everyone piled in. And that happens kind of immediately, which obviously is gonna change your relationship to those people. Like it's sort of, ironically knowing Eric, it's kind of perfect for him. Like he kind of drops in, uh, what do you say, kind of, um, dispenses his kind of wisdom and also benefits you in, in, a, in a real way. How does that change your relationship to those people? Um, and in, we had a conversation about this uh, on Wednesday and one of the, Jenny who's been on the, the app for a long time said that when they started, there was a point at the beginning where that no one cared about followers and then there was a point where people did and then it was really intense. There were all of these rooms popping up that were follow for follow, and it really started to change the nature of the conversation on the app. So there's, there's this sort of, there's definitely a sort of clout chasing thing going on at the moment of people sort of positioning themselves and it's starting to matter how many followers you have. So I'm gonna to come to what I think is the most interesting part of this story, which is the conversation or the dynamic between new and old media. So the New York Times and, I'll tell this story from here actually, this, this was a, a tweet that Taylor Lorenz, a New York Times tech journalist made after being on Clubhouse. And the backstory is that P Market is Mark Andreessen. Mark Andreessen is part of Andreessen Horowitz, which is a huge, very influential venture capitalist firm in Silicon Valley. Clubhouse is part of their long game to root around the mainstream media or the, the legacy media as I prefer to call it. And there's been a lot of tension between the big tech and the New York Times in particular, but legacy media and big tech. I try to avoid saying the word mainstream media because I think it kind of obscures more than it, more than it covers. I'd say legacy media. But there's been a lot of tension between the two for quite a while. Tech feeling that old media doesn't get them, old media feeling that the tech people are just sort of breaking the rules and not really caring and they don't want, or they want to avoid scrutiny. And I think both of those are true in some way. But anyway, so Anderson Horowitz with Clubhouse have deliberately, I mean, it's part of a long game for them. All of these sort of tech investments are part of this long game for them of bypassing and avoiding the control systems of the legacy media. And so Taylor Lorenz posted this on Twitter. Mark Andreessen just openly using the R word. The R word is retard, apparently. Um, the, the, the sort of tech people on Clubhouse apparently call each other autistic and retard all the time. Apparently he didn't do this. It wasn't him that did it. It was someone else in the room that did it. And she was like massively piled on on Twitter, refused to apologize. And this became like a really big thing. And then... Shortly afterwards, she released, so um, 
Taylor Lorenz is a tech journalist at New York Times. She released a piece, a co-written piece about Clubhouse that included the growth of Clubhouse has been accompanied by criticism that women and people of color are frequent targets of abuse and the discussions involving anti-Semitism, homophobia, racism and misogyny are on the rise. I think there are probably concerns about uh, moderation on Clubhouse like there is anywhere else, but I think this has to be seen through a certain lens. And the lens that I found the most useful was an article by Justin Murphy, a blog post by Justin Murphy called Other Life. And I'll read from this because it's, it's really fantastic. Taylor Lorenz writes for the New York Times, mostly about how people in tech are immoral, racist, sexist, harassers, etc. Right now, Lorenz is going hard over cl after Clubhouse. This conflict is more interesting than it appears. First, the design of the Clubhouse app is surprisingly profound because it allows high-status individuals whose status is based on superior belief calibration, successful founders and investors by definition, to calibrate their beliefs privately and also paradoxically to an audience. On the other hand, for high-status individuals whose status is based on prestige institutions, as in the, the New York Times and, and legacy journalists, their only raison d'etre is the historical inability of other high-status people to calibrate and distribute their beliefs independently. Prestige opinion writers once solved a coordination problem for high society. Though not everyone would agree with any given prestige opinion writer, they provided a focal point in the basic premises which all high society players could assume that all other soci higher society would respect. Now this is really reminiscent of, I'm sure a lot of people here will be aware of Jordan Hall's comments, mainly in, in the Deep Code series of articles in some of the films that we've put out where he talks about how good opinion is the way that the blue church used to kind of um, orient society. And good opinion is tied to the legacy media, it's tied to these high profile co columnists. And what Clubhouse allows is for open discussion among people. Um, and here he's talking about superior belief calibration. He's basically saying people who self, rather than people who've got their status from being part of the institutions, like the legacy media, their, their status is from the chair, from the institution that has built up over centuries, not necessarily from their own level of insight or their own level of ability. Successful founders and investors, so basically people who have been tried and tested against reality, so founders and investors, I mean, you can argue whether that necessarily means that they've got better ideas about everything. And I think that's a real danger if people start thinking that. I think that happens an awful lot. And it's one of the criticisms I made of sort of a lot of the galaxy brain thinkers that they may have insight in one area, but they then sort of apply it to different areas. And it's not always the case that just because you, you understand some deep code of society means that you understand all other things. And that's a danger as well. But I think there's a lot of truth in this analysis. And it's, and it's basically challenging the media position as gatekeepers. The, the, the legacy media's whole raison d'etre is that they can decide what, what conversations are up uh, allowed, what are not allowed, how those conversations should happen. Now, I'm equally concerned about the lack of gatekeepers as well, but it was really interesting. This was exactly the dynamic that happened in the kind of New York Times piece about Slate Star Codex recently, which a lot of people described as a hit piece. And I would argue kind of was, was close to, because it, it just kind of, it was almost, it was almost disinformation in the way that they linked together Slate Star Codex and Scott Alexander with Charles Murray, who's kind of infamous from the bell curve and links to kind of race and IQ. They did it in a way that made it sound like, like Scott was validating um, Charles Murray, and he clearly wasn't. If you look at the blog post in, in, in question, he wasn't even referring to that. He was referring to something completely different. And there was quite a few other kind of allusions to, he's talking to people who are beyond the pale, it's very worrying. And it was exactly the same kind of framing of this person's dangerous, trust us to keep you safe. We're the ones who know how to gatekeep. And the, the, increasingly it's been obvious that the, the legacy media is losing credibility very fast. Lots of ideological takeover, lots of kind of just obvious failures in, in legacy media. Um, and so coming back to the, the Justin Murphy's point. 
What if suddenly high status individuals started calibrating their beliefs in private but sca scalable groups segmented by personality and industry? It destroys a key competitive advantage of prestige editorial. The cutting edge really starts to cut and thereafter the only way for any public intellectual to think or write on it for an intelligent audience is to calibrate one's own mental models against the raw data of the world, ignoring prestige middlemen as much as possible, respecting only other people with similarly uncorrelated minds calibrated to the raw data of the world. Now this comes back to something that the likes of Eric Weinstein and Jordan Hall have talked about as well, is that the, the, the legacy media in the New York Times in particular, part of their game is to create a, a narrative by shading language, what they call um, Russell conjugation language, where you describe someone as controversial, you just, uh, attach epithets to their names, and it tells people who the good guys and the bad guys are. And this is basically saying it's, it's unable to play that game anymore if you've seen these people for real. And the other really interesting thing that I'm going to come to with this clip. So recently, I'm sure many people will be aware, Brett Weinstein had this run in on Clubhouse with what you could only really call kind of a cancel culture woke mob. And there was a lot of articles about, oh, wow, Clubhouse is, is a woke cancel culture wasteland. What I think the Justin Murphy piece shows is that's fundamentally... It's actually the opposite because a lot of supposedly cancelled people have actually made a comeback on Clubhouse. A lot of the people who are hugely popular on Clubhouse, Eric Weinstein being one of them, don't have any basis in the legacy media. A lot of people have come back on Clubhouse and actually I've spoken to people who've been on there for a very long time and they say it was, it was actually far worse. I'm going to play the clip. Um, this is about a minute clip of the the thing that happened to Brett the other day. He was in a room, ironically, that was created to discuss is Clubhouse too obsessed with the woke? And it was taken over by a group of black activists who then brought Brett on stage. And this is a this is a cut down of about a minute worth of that audio. Brett Weinstein, yeah, I'm calling you out. Somebody that they really promote on this app, right? And this nigga's mad racist. Okay, can we speak to the fact if you are anti-wokeness and the progression of black people, do you believe in white supremacy? Do you believe in uh, white sure. purpose? Are those sentiments that you stand by? Um, people here are saying that you have spewed racism across this app, so can you speak and to that? Transphobia. Okay, uh, I'm happy to do all these things, but I would ask you to try to listen. No, fully no to listen, I'm listen, no, white man, we're in charge friend. here, okay? We ask you some questions, you can answer them or you can go. I don't understand how you think this works. OK, we can have a oh disagreement. We can have a disagreement about whether or not. Like, I'm you sound like my no, we can have a disagreement. Yeah, Brett, you're going to have to go to the audience you and you need to cash up everybody up here. A thousand dollars for you coming back up. So that was as I said, that was in a room discussing whether there was too much wokeness on on Clubhouse. Um, but as I said, the interesting thing is that the only reason that that happened is the, the guy who created the room, Michael Tracy, gave moderator privileges to one of the activists. And then that activist kicked all of everyone else off, off stage and then brought on a load of their friends and made them moderators. So that's another interesting factor is I think moderation is king on Clubhouse. If you've got moderator privileges, you have kind of complete control of the conversation. Just coming back to that Taylor Lorenz piece where she described, she used basically social justice ideology as a weapon against Clubhouse. And that is what is really interesting. I think that in many people's view, the legacy media has been now taken over by this ideology because it's a very, very effective power system. And that's, what I, that's why I think she used that as a particular attack on Clubhouse. And that's the main weapon I think that the legacy media has against these new tech um, companies. I think that's everything I wanted to say. Um, I'm gonna pass on to Ali because the, the other really fascinating factor in this is what might be possible with this new, new medium, what might be possible with this new technology. Yeah, awesome, thanks David. And yeah, so what I'd like to do is um, zoom out a bit and I suppose take a kind of uh, sociological perspective on it, looking at the, in some sense, the development of how we communicate on the internet. And Clubhouse may 
provide us with with a new way to do that that actually takes us uh, further into into new types of conversation, or it may not. But um, if we just kind of rewind to around this time last year, sort of Zoom became sort of globally known. You know, a bunch of us probably knew about Zoom already or had used it. Um, and so because of an increase in bandwidth primarily, uh, and obviously because of COVID being the main reason, a lot of people went on Zoom and started having, uh, obviously doing all sorts, education, regular conversations. At the same time, places like Rebel Wisdom and the Stoa and other communities, we started moving what we were doing online. And so, you know, we, we have uh, traditionally done a lot of in-person events, trying to have new types of conversation that go beyond ideology trying to be aware of our nervous systems, using techniques from, from mindfulness, for example, using the breath, trying to basically find new frames of reference through conversation. And as we started doing more and more of that online, it became really, you know, I, I became really fascinated by it. Okay, some, something's really uh, possible on this, this medium of voice and audio. And, you know, many people have done a lot of interesting events. You know, we, we've done probably hundreds now um, sessions where people are exploring collective intelligence or authentic relating, lots of different practices. And this, this whole phenomena of people leaving the main social networks because we don't feel we can have real conversations on there without being uh, attacked. That's something that uh, Yancey Strickler has pointed out. It's this concept of the dark forest. Um, which comes from a, a sci-fi book called The Three-Body Problem. It's the idea of why aren't there any aliens? Well, it's because everyone's being really, really quiet because nobody wants to put their head out in the in the very dangerous dark forest. So I think there's this wider re retreat or maybe like uh, movement into these digital campfires, you know, of, of, which is actually, you know, probably what we're doing right now. And what I think is very interesting about the digital campfires and this is something I've uh, written about uh, for uh, John Verveke's uh, new kind of anthology, which I think Peter is, is also in, is that trying to understand, okay, well, why are we doing this? Of all the things that we could be doing with our time, you know, we could just be on Netflix instead of being in this call right now, or we could be on Netflix instead of being on Clubhouse. There's something about meeting together and having a kind of conversation that takes us beyond our normal frame of reference that we desperately crave, you know, and Verveki calls us dialogos. You know, this is really lies at the heart of Western philosophy. This kind of dialogue that changes us. Uh, we use a technique called inquiry, which is a kind of talking meditation. There's circling and authentic relating. There's lots of different practices that help us do that. And me and Zoom is just about good enough for us to be able to do that. It's not quite the same as face-to-face -face interaction, but it's it's pretty good. And so. Uh, and yeah, just the final thing on that of, of why are we doing that? I think it's it's interesting to look at this whole idea of frames in, in terms of the the culture wars and in terms of the stagnation of what we see on regular social media, which is text only usually and asynchronous. So it's happening, you know, it's it's not happening at the same time. And there's something very difficult about getting out of your frame of reference in that mode, I think. It's very difficult to do it through text. You don't get tone of voice. You don't get this human connection. You don't get a sense of a real person on the other end. It's very dehumanizing. And so when do we move from that into this, what we're doing right now, something starts to shift. And it's a lot easier to call someone a dickhead like face to face. Like if Peter and I are having an argument, it's it's like, and everyone's here watching, I'm, I'm gonna behave myself more than in text. Um, and so, and not only that, so not only is the conversation level better, but also if we start doing practices in this format, we, we start to kind of exercise our cognitive flexibility. We start to be able to see things in new ways. We start to be able to take on multiple perspectives. And instead of this kind of reciprocal narrowing, as, as John Verbeke has pointed out, that we get with when your frame of reference gets smaller and smaller, which I think you get with ideology and, and kind of when mimetic tribes are just in battle and, and hunkering down, we get this kind of reciprocal opening where we expand our frame of reference and that's growth and wisdom and truth. And so I think that's one of the reasons we're seeking it out. So then the question is, well, why don't we just keep doing that on Zoom? Wouldn't that be easier than like all the kind of pain of going onto a whole new platform, which has its own etiquette, et cetera. And I think, and this is really fresh thoughts, but we've, we've only really been experimenting for a couple of weeks with Clubhouse. But one of the reasons is that there's something unique about voice only 
compared to voice and video. And really uh, serendipitously, uh, a study came out in Stanford, I think last week, uh, at least that's when I first read about it. And it was looking at Zoom fatigue, which is this phenomena that we've probably all experienced of just this tiredness and fatigue of being on Zoom for a long time. And this study is, uh, like I said, it's at Stanford, it's by Jeremy Balinson. And some of the stuff I found really interesting in that is that he points out that um, interpersonal distance fundamentally influences our emotion and behavior. And he draws on the research of a, an anthropologist called Edward Hall in that. And then he kind of updates it for the modern world. And he talks about the intimate space. And intimate space, according to this research, is about 60 centimeters, which is about two feet. And usually if someone's in this space, it's family or intimate friends. But often on Zoom, you have someone right in your face. Like right now, you're all really, really close to me. I can see all of your faces in gallery view. And in a sense, as far as my nervous system is concerned, it may well actually be quite exposing you know, and, and quite kind of confronting in some way. So, and I think, you know, we can, you can play with the distance. He actually recommends moving the laptop back a little bit, but that's, that's one element I think I've noticed certainly just disappears with Clubhouse. There's a kind of freeing uh, of, of maybe even cognitive capacity of not having to be watched, be seen. And he also points out in this study that actually seeing yourself in the, like I can see myself in the Zoom box right now is a very strange thing neurologically. It's like having someone walking around with a mirror in front of your face. And every time you want to say something to your friends, they're like, oh, hang on a second. I think you should see yourself while you say this. Very, very strange thing. A lot of that goes away with Clubhouse and we get this, this audio only um, way of interacting. And so I think there's a lot of potential in Clubhouse for that. Um, I, you know, one of, uh, one of our friends, Mel Tal, who's who's kind of advised Clubhouse and worked with them a, a lot, met, told us in a call recently um, that, and in fact, a community call that the actual the modulation, like the frame, the hertz that Clubhouse used to modulate the sound of the voice, is like bang in the middle of a kind of place of comfort and safety and and kind of relaxation for the nervous system. So there's that technical element to it as well, but but as well as that, there's there's just the the overall um, experience of voice only, there's a kind of focusing in and there's a kind of um, relaxation and a lack of pressure that I've certainly found with Clubhouse. So just to finish, I think what's exciting about it as a, uh, a technology is that it's a place that we could practice some of the, what Viveki calls psychotechnology. So these different practices that help us zoom out or zoom in to our frames in a way that could actually be more effective than what we're doing on Zoom because of that. And, and we haven't yet explored it. it it's, it's fertile ground. So, you know, that what we're going to be doing on Clubhouse in a moment is exploring it in more detail to see, like, could we could we steal the Clubhouse culture? Could could Clubhouse become a place of real genuine dialogue, real dialogos, real practice, instead of like LinkedIn style clout chasing of, of which there's a lot. There's also a lot of good stuff on there already, I should point out. But so that's that's the, the, the inquiry and I think that's what's exciting about it. Great, thank you, Ali. Um, Ned, you are with us. So Ned Kenny runs a room called Superlative and has been on Clubhouse for a lot longer than we have. And Ned, I'd love to hear if you've got any reflections or thoughts about uh, my presentation, which I obviously I've been kind of <laughs> studying it very quickly. I've uh, only been on it for a couple of weeks, so I'm kind of trying to pick up. But I'd love to hear if you've got any thoughts, riffs, and I know you've had a few of your own experiences with moderation that I think it would be great to to hear a bit more about. So thank you for joining us. Sure. You guys hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, David, everything you said was, seemed on point to me. This has been a, a fascinating discussion so far. Um, so as they say on Clubhouse, to piggyback on what you said, um, my headline on this is it's a it's really a next level platform, and I, I work in developing consumer apps, and there's something special about this, um, just in terms of of uh, that feeling that you get. You know, it's kind of this ineffable. Just there's something about it, and it's all these things you mentioned. You know, the fact that you don't have to be insecure about what you look like. You know, on on video and you know, just the synchronous element of it, all these things combine into this thing that is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, the ability to assemble 
really smart people that are uniquely qualified to opine on whatever topic you're discussing. It reminds me of Reddit. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only person on this on this call who loves Reddit and will go down Reddit rabbit holes. And it's just there's so many perspectives that Reddit act activated from like just insightful nerds around the world. And I get the sense that uh, the Clubhouse is doing the same thing. I mean, one example is a few weeks ago I did a room on um, on public health, the public health community's mistakes. You know, on things like you know discouraging masks at first. And we had probably seven or eight doctors and, and public health people, people experts in vaccines on stage talking about this kind of stuff. I hadn't arranged anything with people beforehand. So the, the power to get really qualified people to talk about things is, I, I have not seen it in real time. I have not seen that on any other platform. Um, there are some weird downsides to it. I mean, I, I tend to think of, um, of rooms on Clubhouse if you're letting people up on stage as you know, live podcasts where the fourth wall is broken down repeatedly by strangers. Um, that can be a wonderful and serendipitous thing. It can also get weird really quickly. So I personally have, have been scaling back kind of how many people I bring up from the audience, especially people that I, I haven't spoken with prior to that because somebody can seem totally normal. And then it's just like, oh, they're just here to watch this burn. Okay. Um, and that can get really awkward, um, especially if somebody is bullying people and just creating every problem they can while claiming victim status. Um, that confers a sort of invincibility in this you know, new woke world. And the, especially now the audience on Clubhouse does skew left. I think it'll, it'll become more representative of the overall population, obviously, as more people come on. But for now, it's skewed left. Um, and who is saying something? in many of these rooms matters more than what that person is saying. It's been very interesting to watch. Like I'm a straight white, six foot two, raised Christian male, grew up in a suburb of New York City. Like I have had so much unearned privilege, like based on these identity categories. And in my life, it's been a wind at my back. And I find it hilarious and poetic. I have to admit that on Clubhouse, it's the first time that all of those things have turned into huge liabilities. <laughs> it's pretty funny. In the moment, I'm not laughing when somebody tells me to you know, shut my white, my white mouth or whatever else. And by the way, it's sometimes white people saying that to me. Um, it's just very interesting how everything has been kind of inverted in this, uh, in this new world that we're in. Uh, but there's still a lot of very normal and incredible people. Um, the diversity on there, you know, this word diversity is thrown around a lot in disingenuous ways. I think in the way that diversity does matter, uh, and it does, uh, you will see that on Clubhouse. I mean, there's just an, an impossibly eclectic mix of people. And, you know, yeah, I run into some woke weirdos for sure of all colors and creeds. I've also run into, you know, basically assembled a, a group of people I would call friends that, you know, we've been talking about. I've, I've, I've gone on walks with a couple of them, but as things open up and we're actually looking forward to spending time together in person and, you know, kind of translating a clubhouse friendship into an IRL friendship. So hopefully those of you who have not experienced that magic uh, will, will have a chance to do so uh, soon. I really believe in it, but the opportunity for people looking for trouble to come in and start fires is absolutely there. And so I, I don't want to go on too much longer, but if you are going to be moderating rooms, just be really mindful of keeping your stage relatively small. Ideally, only bring people up that you've spoken with before. And uh, don't hesitate to, to push back on folks that are just looking to start shit because they are out there. And they have very clever ways of making it seem like they're earnest or doing something good. But at the end of the day, it's like some people just want to watch the world burn and your room burn. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's incumbent upon you to, to push back. I've, I've gotten kind of pushed around in those rooms. And to figure out how to be firm while also being compassionate um, is has been an ongoing struggle. And I still have more questions than answers, but that's what's kind of fun about this is nobody has any friggin' idea what they're doing. It's all new. So we're all figuring it out together. And I think that that's what kind of adds to the enjoyment in a way. Awesome. Now, do you have any tips? Like, cause that's, I mean, when I, when I listen to like the, the Brett Weinstein thing and I kind of think about moderating, it just gives me a sense of real dread. Do you have any tips for how to deal with that sort of thing? You mentioned kind of making sure that you're kind of compassionate but firm. Uh, keep your stages relatively small. On Clubhouse, you will see a lot of stages that have like 12 moderators and 40 people on stage. 
the reason that happens, and I've been guilty of this too, is because if you have more people on stage, that gets more, it, the algorithm shows the room to more people in their hallway. So it's a way of goosing your numbers. And because moderators like to scratch each other's back. So oh, I'm modding you here for no good reason. And you're just going to take up real estate on the stage. And I therefore expect you to do the same for me at a later date. It's that kind of stuff. You really only need, uh, you know, to, you can be a solo mod in a room, two, three moderators max, honestly. Other than, you know, beyond that, it, it gets to a diffusion of responsibilities that actually I think has negative utility. Um, keeping the stage small, maybe you have a core of people on stage, you know, three, four, five, six people. And then you have guests that come up and, um, you know, you tell them ahead of time, hey, we'd love to bring people up from the audience. Um, you know, we'll give you a minute to, you know, give your comment or 30 seconds to ask a question. Just in order to make space for as many people as possible, we will be uh, rotating people off the stage. So I think communicating rules ahead of time is, has been beneficial to me. Again, I'm like not an expert on this, but like have have kind of suffered through some some unforced errors. So yeah, I would say communicating rules up front. Personally, in my rooms, I, I say uh, we do not allow scolding or sanctimony, which helps a lot because that's really what kind of poisons this room. It's the, this modern leftist stuff. It's this, not only are you wrong, but you are bad, bad. It's like somebody scolding a puppy, you know, that shits on the rug. It's just so condescending and then people will just not respond well to that. So just warding that off saying, just you can disagree with people, don't be sanctimonious. Um, and then we say, assume good faith in other people, because that's another thing that people will do. It's like, well, okay, I can't find fault with anything you said. So now I'm just going to cast aspersions on your motivations or something. You guys have seen this a million times. That also poisons rooms. So we try to get out in front of that. We assume that all of our interlocutors here are acting in good faith. Time limits. Uh, I generally stick to a two minute per person time limit. And then I can say, all right, anybody on stage, if you want to respond to what some, somebody said, keep it 60 seconds or less. Um, that has a benefit, not just in that uh, it stops people from droning on and on and on. But when people have a time constraint, it, you know, it's like an engine. It needs that kind of constrained area in order to, in order to work. Um, people will think ahead of time. It's like, okay, now I only have two minutes. What, are, what is the most important message I want to communicate? As opposed to just no time limits. Somebody, so uh, let's see here. What's the prompt again? I'm just going to talk out of my ass for seven minutes and have no respect for anybody else's time. Good faith actors, just no self-awareness. That happens a lot. So I'd say two minute uh, length, um, two minute time limit helps. Um, and, you know, everybody can figure out their own rules. I also say, depending on what you're talking about, there may not be a need to, like, if we're talking about, if you're talking about like transgender people in, you know, women's athletics, right, you're going to need to have a set of ground rules up front and like kind of be draconian about enforcing them because that can go off the rails quickly. If you're talking about something completely uncontroversial, there might not be a need to, to mention the rules at all. So I'd just say play around with it, but to the extent you do have rules, communicate them upfront clearly and enforce them fairly, you know, across, uh, across everybody in the room. Thank you, that's really super useful, Ned, thank you. Peter, did you have any thoughts? We've got about a, a 10 minutes left in here. Yeah, so, so I think what we'll do is if you have any questions, just throw them in the chats and then we'll kind of talk about them. Uh, and when we pivot to Clubhouse and uh, I'll, I'll talk to David, Ali and Ned uh, for the next 10 minutes. Um, yeah, so at my first question is for the, the, the three of you. Um, so with how I hold the STOA, there's like this anti-marketing strategy. There's like a part of me that wants it to become like hype and famous, but then there's another part of me that doesn't. And so that's why there's like, we don't have any YouTube comments. There's no tagging. There's all these obscure event titles. But then that kind of that fame algorithm tugs me sometimes like, oh, I can get this guy on this, this, and this. But then I intimately feel that felt sense of when that fame algorithm comes online. And then with the STOA, I'm keeping it kind of like that anti-marketing strategy because I want to grow this in a slow way. But when I'm on uh, Clubhouse, that fame algorithm just tugs hard. Um, and it's like, I just see the potential of just getting a lot of people quickly, fast, and, you know, I just, I'm, I'm kind of like, there's an allergy towards that. I, that's why I'm kind of like, I don't know how to interface with this thing yet. Um, so I, I just wanted to share that. And then kind of maybe a question that could uh, um, engender from that is, and double click on the clout chasing thing in this, this uh, the title of this talk, is this a thing with Clubhouse? And is it kind of um, embedded in the app itself, how it's designed or the culture that's associated with it? Um, 
this kind of like this, maybe this fame algorithm that, you know, that people come in and then just get lost in. So I'll just throw that out there. Yeah. I, I can speak to the felt sense of the other day when Eric dropped into our room and we suddenly went to 2000 people from like a hundred and I was sort of scrolling down. It was just like the, the page just kept going, the number of people in the room and that felt sense of that excitement stayed for like a few hours afterwards of like, oh, we were talking to, and then I started tracking like, were the people still there? Did we manage to keep them? And um, then, a, then a really boring guy got up on stage and I was like, oh, I bet you were losing loads of people. And I kept checking, it's like, yep, we lost 300 people when this guy was talking. And I was messaging Ali and I was like, oh, I've got to get this guy off stage. We're just shedding listeners like, like nobody's business. Um, and that, yeah, that really, I, I was really aware of that because of our first experience. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear from Ned. Like, how do you feel? I don't know how long you've been on, Ned, but, but the other day, Jenny said that she felt that the nature of the platform changed at one point and this became a factor. It started mattering how many followers people had and it, it didn't at one point. Any social media platform, people are going to be, you know, preoccupied to some extent with vanity metrics. I mean, the number of followers you have is a major determinant of how many people will come into your rooms, at least preliminarily. But they're only going to stick around if you have good content. You mentioned Eric. It's very interesting what happens when somebody like him, Brett, um, you know, there's a handful of people that have super big followings. And, and it, it presents a really interesting set of challenges as moderators. What do you do when this person comes in, you know, to a room with a hundred people in it and within 30 seconds, the room now has 1500 people and this person's on stage and you had enforced a 90 second time limit. So are you now going to make, are, are you going to enforce the same limits on this person? Or are you going to basically tell, are you going to give the audience what they want? Most of the audience at that point is there for this person, thereby relegating the other people on stage to second class citizens. There's no good answers there. It's a really tough thing to do. Um, generally speaking, I, I do give more time to people that bring in those big audiences because it's like people are here to listen to this person. Uh, I also get a tremendous amount of shit for that every time I do it. So still have not figured that out. Hmm. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. Like what Ned was just saying about uh, in in a sense, it intensifies the, the pressure to deliver something authentic and just good to keep people in the room. It's it's so easy for people to leave. So I think, yeah, I definitely feel that, Peter. Like I definitely feel that, like a clout chasing side of myself because it's exciting, it's new, it's um, it's speech based. So it just feels like it's kind of what what we all do a lot. You know, we talk about things, so it feels like a natural home. But at the same time, I've also noticed really having to step up and think like, oh, OK, there's a lot of people I don't know here who aren't in my normal community or audience or world. And so I actually have to step up and, and try and express myself in a, in a way that's both clear, relevant and interesting. So I think it I think it does both. But I yeah, I resonate. I agree with what Ned was just saying, like it, it's um, it's kind of sink or swim in a lot of ways. And I think that that can have a positive effect on on cloud chasing. Yeah, yeah. Alexander, that's a. Sorry, real quick. That's a really, really good, good point and an important one. And, and really, it raises the question, maybe the most important question of all, which is, who is your as a moderator? Which is who, who are whose well being are you optimizing for? Right? If somebody's being boring, right, and people are not getting value out of the room anymore, you could think, all right, it's incumbent upon you to be like, I'm sorry, you just honestly, people are shoving Q tips in their ears, trying to, you know, just trying to just stop the pain of having to listen to you right now. So I'm going to have to, you know, interrupt you or are you going to optimize for that person's feelings because it's going to be hurtful to them to be shut down? It's a really tough optimization question. And it kind of, uh, but, but I think sociopaths would actually have an easier time with this than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. And perhaps we can uh, continue this thread on the app. Um, one of my working hypotheses is that in order to steal the culture, you know, culture needs to keep the egos in check, not be like subservient to ego. Um, and just what Fuller was talking about, the dynamic, it's like, you know, that that 2,000 people came in the room, it's a fucking high, you know? So how is this app or the culture of the app shaping us in unexamined ways? And we're just being seduced by an old culture. Um, so yeah, so that's at the kind of the, the edge of my thinking there. Yeah, the only thing that I would say is that I've enjoyed, 
I've enjoyed, like I felt a real sense of kind of liberation of talking to a new audience about the sort of stuff that we've been talking about for a long time. And, and there's so many of the issues that we've, certainly on Rebel Wisdom, I'm sure on the Stoa as well, that we've talked about, like the, the limbic hijack of the, of the social media companies, the need for novelty and dialogue, and these kind of, the, 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 the kind of psycho technologies that we've been, we've been looking at how to do that. And it goes down really well. Like people are really open to this conversation. And each time we've gone on, I've had messages on, on Twitter or people coming up on stage saying that this is the best room they've ever been on in Clubhouse. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's, I think that's just because I think what we what we have to talk about, what we have been talking about is really interesting. And I think finding ways to talk about it in a way that connects with a wider audience is really, it, it's interesting. And it's, it feels like a real opportunity to do that while keeping the clout chasing and fame algorithms in check, of course. It's to be determined, we'll, we'll find out. Um, yeah. now, now, now we're gonna be tested. Yeah, yeah, now it's a spiritual practice at Clubhouse. Uh, maybe that's a good reframe uh, for it. Clubhouse is a spiritual practice. Now that is a name that will definitely get people into the room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. <That's> cool. <laughs> Since the beginning of Rebel Wisdom, we've been thinking about how to create spaces for people to have new kinds of conversations around big ideas. Which is why we've just launched our digital campfire, which is a central place for people to gather, to find the others, and to make sense together. It's a place to practice the skills we talk about on the channel. So we have regular sessions that help us improve our sense making, and also tap into our collective intelligence. And it's all hosted on a discussion platform called Circle, where you can have conversations around our films and articles, or on any other topic you're interested in. We've designed it all to be participatory, so you can set up real-time conversations by creating a crew to dive deeper into different topics or practices. So we've got three different levels of membership, Wise Rebel, Explorer, and Sensemaker. All three levels have access to the digital campfire on Circle. And the explorers also have access to the following official Rebel Wisdom Run sessions. So on Mondays, we have live sense making, which is a session where we come together to discuss a hot cultural topic. And then on Tuesdays, we have our academy sessions, where we have some of the best facilitators in the world teaching various skills. So for example, collective intelligence practice, facilitation training. Then on Thursday, we have our connection gym. And the sense makers are also invited to our Wednesday sessions, which alternates between Q&A and the Wisdom Gym. The Q&A is with one of the stars of our films and will often go up on the channel itself. And the Wisdom Gym is where we bring in some of the biggest names in transformation and growth to share their practices with us. Within Circle, we've also included a number of resources that we found useful. So sense making tools, meditations, authentic relating games, and guides for how to host your own session. So the most important thing to remember is that this is an experimental space and is designed to be participatory. So it's really your space to come in and make your own. So we'd love to see you there.